Okay, so hello everybody. I'm glad you come to this afternoon presentation. My name is Jakub Stolman and today I will be talking about our transformation of monitoring in our company. So let's start with it. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm so you heard you heard my, my name already, and I am also network system engineer in Lysport. I do stuff with networking, and I also do stuff with some automation things. And recently, I have become a Python and Isinga enthusiast. You can also check out my Twitter account, which I don't use, <laughs> and uh, also you can send me an email. So, what what will be this about? Generally, we will be talking about transforming from Nagios monitoring system to Isinga monitoring system. Is there anybody who knows something about these systems, who heard of them? Just raise your hand. Yeah, great. So, so for, the, for the people who don't know, these are real-time monitor, real monitoring systems. They, they basically work like uh, they check periodically for some services and they'll they then they send the notifications. So let's go through the formal things, the agenda. First of all, we will introduce our company. Then we will go through the, our motivation. And uh, then we will go through this new conception and how we deploy this solution. And we will talk about future. So what's, what's live sport? Is there anybody who heard about live sport? Okay, my colleagues and some people, okay. Thank you. So live sport. We are a live score provider. What, what does it mean? We provide live scores from various sports events. So like when you when people are watching football, we provide this live score to the application or website. So you can see if there is some goal or even like this. And let's go for the technical things. We operate around 500 hosts. Uh, the disk contain also physical servers, virtual servers, and we also have some network hosts like router switches. Uh, we have now three locations. One is the main and the second are not so important, let's say. And we have lots of traffic. And like every IT company nowadays, we are growing. So what was our motivation? We will start with this checklist. Uh, yeah, the first once upon a time there was this checklist, and it was this checklist about adding a server to monitoring. Uh, first of all, you basically install your server, then you edit some manual, edit some configuration, uh, then you check for errors, then you fix these errors, you restart the monitoring system to reload configuration, check for errors again because they are some usually, then you fix it and again and again and repeat this process. Uh, in graphical form, we can see it looks like this. So you add host, then you edit some configure files. You add this host to host groups, which define some services for this host. Then you check for errors and you do, do this like I said. Let's see an example. This is our configuration file. You can see there are some hosts defined, and uh, for imagination, we can have uh, we, we had 500 hosts. So imagine that uh, you have this file full of these 500 hosts. This is a really really big mess, I think. So yes, you can find some some hosts there, but it's not so easy. Then we can check out how we define services for these hosts. Yeah, this is host group definition and. This whole mess of text is one line. So when you wanted to edit this, it wasn't really easy. Let's go for the second point, crowded web interface. In this picture, we can see some kind of tactical overview of front end page of Truk. It's the web interface for Nagios. Uh, you can see there's some red, red, uh, no buttons. Yeah, it could be buttons. We can call it buttons. And they call. They say uh, there is some problem in the monitoring system. There are some events you need to handle, and problem in our, uh, with us was uh, that we handle these events by different way. When there was some problem and it wasn't solved really 
at this time and that time, uh, the people just only disable notifications. So it stayed there, like in this red red column, you see 49 services disabled. So it stayed like that and nobody cared about it. So this is the first bad thing. It also looked like that. This is the bad service overview, let's say. And uh, you can see there are also disabled services. And uh, when some, some bad service appeared, it, it could appear in the middle of uh, this file and you, you won't notice it because there are so many. So, let's sum it up. Uh, so we had manual configuration. So there was, in this config structure, there was almost no possibility of automation. When you have one file, you need to do some edits and complication. That's not really good. We had bad incident handling because we were disabling notifications. We were not acknowledging this, these events. We were not setting down times. So this result in an unreadable front end. And uh, yeah, for the sum up, we had uh, approximately 10,000 lines of configurations, which you need to edit manually. And the last point, of course, no high availability, which is really important nowadays. So this was our current mood. So let's change it. Let's, let's move it. Let's state what we needed to handle. We need to handle 500 hosts, like I said. Then we had so, uh, for them 5,000 services, which were not unique because, yeah, for example, for every service you monitor some memory or some demons. And uh, we'd like to handle notifications, which were in the, in the past they were sent only to our team, our technic or admin, Linux admin team, and we'd like to send them also to developers. So we created this list of requirements, which consists of automated configuration, automatic on-call setup, which uh, we have done it manually before, multi-channel notifications, so you can send the notifications uh, by SMS, you can send it by Slack, you can set it by the channel you want. Tailored notifications, so you get notifications you really want. For example, only warnings. And uh, of course, high availability, uh, distribution to multiple locations, and uh, readable front end, so we will set up the processes. So let's prepare. For the first, we need some software. Nagios free, yeah. We can maybe we can rework this configuration file and and do it the better way. But why? Nagios three is pretty old software, and it's I think it's not even supported, and it's, it haven't, haven't hasn't been updated for a long time. So why would we use it? And also, yeah, there is some version of Nagios. It's uh, I think eleven or nine. <laughs> I don't know really. But it's not free, yes, it's commercial product. So that we don't want it. So we need something else. And uh, we need something which will match our requirements. Uh, we, we can easily migrate to this software because we would like to have this. And we can use it effectively and our people, our administrators will understand it. So once well, one time I was at some conference with Isinga and I noticed that this exists. And I, I almost think that's, that's the best software for us because Isinga has JSON style configuration. It's not JSON, but it's almost JSON, which is really unfortunate. But <coughs> it has same fact functionality as Nagios. So you have this object structure like host, services, commands, etc. You, you have uh, high availability options. Uh, it's shipped in the box with Isinga, so that's really cool. And you have modular architecture, so if you want to install some module or some new extension, there is no problem. You just install it, configure it, and you are done. You don't need to edit some source code of things like that. On Nagios, it was pretty complicated. What about the old configuration? We can migrate this, but do we want to migrate the 
10,000 lines of code? No, I think no. Let's just use it for some cross-checking if we migrate it all configuration to new system. So let's start with automated configuration. In automated from configuration, you need some kind of flow. When you have data, you take some data and you generate some configuration from this data. What are these data? You need to some information about host devices. You need IP addresses mainly. You need some services, which will come from some service discovery, for example. And you need other information, like you want to customize these notifications, so you need some tags or things like that. What we will use in our company? We have Puppet. We have Puppet man managing servers, so it's really best option to use Puppet DB for these servers. Because when the Puppet is run on server, it loads all information about this server into Puppet DB, which is centralized database, which, run, which is running on some server. And then you can read, read information about all these servers and get things you want from them. Example of this Puppet DB is not so great example, but it's a screenshot from web frontend of Puppet board. And the most important thing is, I think I can, sorry, I can, oh, sorry for this. Uh, I tried to point this. So you can see here are the, some facts, which are, this is, this is something which is included in Puppet and you can generate your own. These are basically information about the servers. Um, there are many information you can see there are some volume groups, there, are, there is some virtual thing which notices if the server is virtual or it's physical, et cetera, et cetera. So let's move on. So we have PuppetDB. Then we have another database, which is System Rack Tables. It's based on MySQL. And what, what is it? It's practically our data center databases, like uh, the, the name of this uh, system stays is rack tables, so uh, they're, they're all servers uh, and uh, network devices and uh, PDUs and, and things like that are in the system for, in our company. So we, we add them manually or we add them automatically, it doesn't matter for now. And as you can see on this screenshot, there are some information like serial numbers, there are information like IP addresses, ports, and uh, also we have, I think it's not here, this switch, but uh, we have also tags for, for teams which belong the host to. So we have rec tables. They are based on MySQL, I guess, stated, so you have no problem reading that from the da database. And also we have the third data source, which is some kind of internal databases, we, which, which we have uh, users stored at and things like that, like on calls and this uh, administration definitions. So we have these data sources and uh, we need this diagram. When we take these data sources into some, some kind of generator, which, is, which will be or is for now, is Python script. And this Python script will take all data from rec tables, puppet, db, mysql, and sum it and generate the configuration. Just for summing, we have uh, switches, uh, routers, and PDU get uh, from rec tables because uh, they are not in puppet, obviously. We get servers from puppet db, and uh, like I said, these users, things, groups, on calls from mysql. I'd like to also notice that uh, uh, there are some information also from rack tables uh, supplied for service. So, what we want to generate? Uh, we need to point this out because do we need to generate all of the configurations which I stated? There are hosts, there are services, there are users, there are groups. My question is, do we need to generate services automatically? Has anybody some tip or? Let's just leave these services like they are, and uh, we will look at them in the next section. So let's just go through hosts, users, and groups, obviously. So 
Let's start with some kind of directory structure, which will define how we uh, how we store this configuration. Because yes, you can store this uh, configuration in some kind of uh, host directory, and you fill it with hosts, or you can fill one file with hosts. But this really doesn't make sense. So we we created some kind of this. You can inspire by that. We have dynamic and static main directories. So uh, like the name said, the dynamic is filled by automation things, so by this generator. And there are many configurations of hosts, uh, of users. For the static, there are configurations which you need to edit manually. For example, services, like it, we will talk about it. And maybe time periods you won't generate automatically. And it looks like that, so you can do, you can do some uh, some modifications or deep dive into it. So we can have in host, for example, we have definitions, group templates, and then you have some configurations there. So that's all. That's all directory structures done. Let's go through these files we, we, we talk about. So we need to generate hosts, users, and groups. So we need some host files. What, what should it contain? It should contain some IP addresses, uh, note, we, we'd like to have all IP addresses on this server, not only one management IP, because when, for example, when you want to check more service running on public IP. You'd like to have services, which we have discovered by some systemd thing, which lists all systemd services which are enabled and active. We'd like to have some tags. This is our internal thing or something which uh, customizes these notifications or, for example, when you need to disable some checks, for example, backup check. And we need some other variables. You can imagine that like uh, if there is some MD rate on the server. This is our configuration example. And the most important thing from this is the, I think, this, this server tax, when you can see, and also systemd services. This is some kind of list, which is generated from this generator, which takes the data from PuppetDB, and uh, these services are stored them by facts. Uh, at the bottom, you can see this, these variables. You can define whatever you want, and uh, there are there, there is also some list of uh, IP addresses. Let's move on. Let's look at users. User obviously must have a name. You'd like to have some contact details. You'd like to have some status or type for, for notifications because uh, you need tailored notifications, so you need to specify what do you need. You'd like to have on-call state and team, of course. Yeah. Nothing really complicated. Let's just look for example. This is my user file, where we can see there are some information for contacting me. And the most important thing uh, is here when we define notifications options. So this this uh, the direct uh, it's uh, dictionary which said says uh, you have uh, you want to have uh, SMS notifications for acknowledgement, critical, and OK states and email notifications for unknown states. And also we have some variables we can use, for example, when you need some override if not in notifications, etc. Groups, groups, name, name is enough for groups. There is no big business. So let's let's move for the services. Services we we want to generate them automatically, like I said. And why? Imagine you have uh, services. Uh, services like, for example, HTTP check for if the web server is running. And you have this one, and you check it uh, at all your servers, on, 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 or the half of your servers, or many of your servers. So it's one service which is assigned to many services. We have, I think, for uh, it's around 40 or 50 unique services. So when you need to generate this, it's not really easy, and there is no no real easy way to do that. <coughs> so we cannot automate them, but we can we can uh, we can generate some one kind of service, which is 
like I said, this HTTP check. And for what we should do is, we have some developers, which they develop some applications on Node.js, et cetera. And uh, they use this application, they monitor them on the various ports. So they, have, uh, they can have it on port one to three, one to four, et cetera. So we can use the, some service generation on this. When the developer want to monitor their service, uh, he simply enters some uh, link or uh, yes, this address for this check, and uh, he expects some value of this check. So this type of check we can generate, but it's really specific. Let's just move on. So we define it manually. And let's have a look and for example of the service. We have Nginx service here. And the most important part is this of this thing is uh, here. It's assignment. You need to assign this uh, service to the servers which have Nginx stated in some list, which is called host wars, which is var system D services. So when the system D services variable list is filled with Nginx value, they, uh, Isinga will assign this, this check for these servers. We also would like to notice there is some ignore rule. And uh, this is like I called, this, there is some, uh, some tag which says we want to disable this check on the servers which, which there is this disabled tag defined. So that's all for the service. Let's just sum up. So we have this generator Python script and it generates these configurations from various sources like I stated and we have it. So we have done automated configuration for Isinga. We download things from databases, create, uh, create some configurations. We have also done automatic on-call setup because we have generated users which have some variables if they have on-call. And let's just move on for the notification things. Notifications is pretty important thing in this presentation. Isinga has a quite simple con uh, concept in notifications. It's basically it's like uh, if there is state change, then run some command and you can specify command you want. So you can define sending by email, you can send it by check post, you can send it whatever, wherever you want if you define your command. It's quite simple, it's pretty fast, there is no problem, it's, flex, it's flexible so because you, have, you can state your own command. But, but there is some one but. There is no aggregation. So if there is state change, if there is notification race, you run this command, and every time you run this command, you, ha you have your notification on your way, on its way. So you need something which will do some magic. Like we need some parsing thing, we need some aggregating thing, and then we, this thing should send this notification. And what it should be? Should it be command? Should it be some another level of in storing information. Yeah. We can put this information into database. We can just take these notifications and send it to database. And then we can do some magic. And this magic will send notifications to the users and they will receive what they want if the magic will be good. So in a nutshell, how we can raise notification, we just save it to the d database, read it by magic, do the stuff, and then send it via desired channels. But how, how we will put the notification into database? We sh should we write some command, our command which will load it into, or, or how? There is one good tool, which is called Isingabit. It's developed by Singa developers, so it's pretty cool. And uh, we can use this thing. So basically what this does, it takes the notifications and uh, some other information from Isinga, like state changes, etc., and put it into Elasticsearch, like another bit software. 
But so, so we have this notification data now in Elasticsearch. What's next? Next should be some magic. Magic will be a single notificator. What is a single notificator? It's daemon. It's written by me in Python. It's modular, so it tries to, tries to be easy to improve and uh, modify. And uh, it's open source, yeah, you can find it on GitHub, uh, etc. How does this notificator work? It, it works like that, that it's periodically checking these notifications in Elasticsearch in some time period. You need to specify this time period by yourself, but it needs to be good time so you have good uh, sh uh, good balance between uh, aggregated stuff and received stuff so you won't receive notifications after 10 minutes of event. So if there are some notifications, it's process them and mangle them and send it some way to the users. Yeah, if you want to send them by SMS, there is some mangling, shortening the messages, etc. If you want uh, to give rings, there is no no talking by Singa, no, no stuff, it only rings you. It uh, can also send notifications by Slack and it also can send notifications by email. So that's all about the Singa notificator. It's not really great for now, but it's in development. So we have achieved multi-channel multi notifications, which are done by the Singa notificator. We have achieved tailored notifications because Notificator does this also. And uh, we need just to look at uh, the last points, which are high availability, distribution to multiple locations, and this processes thing or readable front end. So let's start with high availability. Like I said, it's in a is shipped with high availability support, so there is really no problem. And there are many high availability concepts in Itzinga. I will show you our concept because there are so, so many. We don't have time to go through that and it's really complicated. So, but you can find it uh, in documentation of Itzinga. So let's have a look at our concept. We have two master service concept. It's called like that, but it's not really two masters. It's one master server and second is almost master server. And I will tell you why. Like you can see on the left side, there is master server, which is, uh, there is Isinga core running of, of this, on this server, of course. There is Isinga web, which is front end. We will talk about it uh, later. <coughs> it, uh, it's on the both servers and it's load balance some way. There is Elasticsearch. It's uh, on. It's uh, not clustered Elasticsearch for now. There is instance of Notificator running because it's a daemon which looks into the Elasticsearch database and sends the notifications out. And there is generator of config. This is one difference between two servers. The configuration is made only on the master server and uh, on this almost master server, which we can call slave but it's really not, not slave. It's, uh, there, there is no possibility of generating this configuration. But when, when there is some event uh, on the master server, which is down, for example, then we can switch it to the second server, but it's, it's not automated. You, can, you will have to do it manually. So let's look uh, at the notificator, high availability things. It's, uh, at the first, I can say it's not really great for now, but we are planning to improve that. And for now it works like uh, that there are instances uh, of notificator on the both servers and they uh, deal with notification on these servers. So when there is a notification on server one, so we can, we can draw something. If there is notification here, it's sent to Elastic here on this first server, then it's processed by notificator on the first server and it's aggregated on this first server. So when there are multiple notifications in our infrastructure, for example, when you have down or all, all one switch and you have all rec down, so there are multiple notifications, you won't get so aggregated stuff. You will, you will get two notifications because the checks or service checks are divided on these two servers. 
for the server one and server two, so there is high possibility of getting the two messages. But we are planning for improve that and uh, create the notif uh, give the notificator way it will work in the cluster environment. So let's just move on. Let's just move on for multiple locations. We will talk about deploying Isinga, not not configuring for the cluster, because in Isinga there is also possibility to configure multiple like locations, like you have some slave servers, you have some another type of slave server, you have master server, and you you basically can do things like you have five local uh, locations and you take the data from these five, five locations and mangle them into one master server and look look on them in that server. We don't use it like this because we have only three locations. And so just let, let's talk about deployment. We'd like to easily deploy Isinga in the various locations when we, we have, for example, new offices or new data center and we'd like to have master server there, not some slave. We'd like to deploy it easily, so we defined it in the Puppet. We used for inspiration uh, official Puppet module, which, which you can look at uh, on the GitHub. It's a really cool module uh, and you can inspire it at them. We don't use this official module because we have more complicated infrastructure and more, more complicated requirements. But there is no problem of using it uh, in the common way. So when we have these puppet definitions, we can deploy Isinga into multiple locations. So you, for example, you include some puppet module on server and the deployment is done. So about summing data I talked before. It's like this HA uh, high availability Zynga things. And uh, let's go for the, I think it's last, last point. It's front end. And uh, this is the system, like I uh, said, is Zynga Web 2. It's the basic front end or default front end for Zynga. When you install it, you would like to have this. You can also use track, but you need to enable live status uh, file like uh, it, it uses from uh, like in Agios. It's possible on Isinga, but you, I think you don't really want to use that. Isinga Web uses MySQL for getting data from Is from Isinga, and the Isinga Core field is MySQL databases. It's called uh, IDO system. It looks like that. Uh, this is the web interface of Isinga 2, which migrated it, we migrated it, and it's not for all. You you need to get used it for use it to that, but uh, it's really nice, I think. <coughs> and uh, on the left side, you can see some service overview, which which the critical services are not up, and when there is right handling of these services, you can see them easily. Also, you need to have set up these downtime things and acknowledgement things. On the right side, you can get some graph graphical information. You can include some some variables, uh, things you want, basically. And what about these uh, processes in our company? I forgot to talk this about. Uh, basically, we stated we need, we want to use these disable notification things. So when you want to acknowledge some problem, you don't disable notifications, do, do it the right way, you just acknowledge, you know, this is the right process which is set up for for a long time, it's not nothing special. So you just set the acknowledgement, you set downtime, you set comments for it. We have automated script, which you can set downtime on the all of the infrastructure. And there is basically no problem with it. So we achieved cluster, possibility of multiple locations we wanted. So we have defined it in Puppet. It's no problem to install this. We have readable front end, we have processes set up so the people won't, hopefully won't disable notifications again. What about future? Yeah, I, I talked about, uh, we'd like to have this high availability notificator because it's really important to have nice aggregated stuff here. Then we'd like to have this automatic serv services generator for developers. Uh, we'd like to full have full deployment with Puppet. 
we have it done partially for now. We'd like to have more tailored notifications. There is a possibility to define uh, what services you'd like to be notified, etc. And basically that's all. For the end, we ha I have some useful links you can look at. There are, there are slides that are uploaded on GitHub, so feel free to download them and look on these li links if you want. And that's all. Thanks for attention. And if there are some questions, we have a lot of time for now, 10 minutes, so there is no problem to talk about. Može bi aj česki. No, tam je ten hlavný dôvod, že Aha, že otázka znela, že prečo e, používame medzi článok ako Elasticsearch a neposielame notifikácie rovno i e, Tam ide hlavne o to, že tam nie je možnosť nejakej agregácie. Človek by si na to musel napísať celkom zložitý notification command, ktorý by nejak tie data od tej e aj tak musel do nejakého bufferu dostávať. Takže my, použi my vlastne sme si z toho elastiku robili ako keby buffer, e, ktorý je nejak prakticky nejaká Q alebo nejak tak. Myslím si, že na miesto elastiku by sa dali použiť aj iné technológie, ale my sme sa chopili toho, že tam je ten bit a vlastne to stačí len nainštalovať, hodiť do konfigu nejaké 2-3 riadky a je to všetko vlastne funkčné. Hej. To, keby sme chceli niečo iné, tak tam nič moc také nebolo zabudované a museli by sme to kodiť a strácať na tom čas, čo na, na to sme čas vlastne nemali. Uh, tam bol hlavne problém, my to máme tak, že nám ako pohotovosti chodia aj sms -ky. a nepáčilo sa to ľuďom hlavne v tom, že trbarsky, keď človek posiela tie sms per ten komand, tak by chodilo hlavne veľa sms -iek. Kto následne skončí v tom, že vás zablokuje operátor, pretože posielate strašne veľa sms -iek. takže to je prvý problém a druhá vec je aj, že to ako otravuje, keď tam pýpa tá sms každý každých, ja neviem, 5 sekúnd a Hlavne, keď je nejaký veľký problém, napríklad, ja neviem, spadne polka data centra, alebo je nejaký problém na sieti, tak príde, fakt je tam proste tisíc servisov, ktoré sú kritiká. Áno, je dobre mať nastavené nejaké dependencie, áno, to je jedna vec, ale nikdy to nebude dokonalé. Takže proste je nutné, aby, aby toto, proste ten, ten vlastne ten notifikátor, alebo vlastne ten elastik to nejak vie zhromaždiť a zgrupiť to do nejakej jednej sms -ky. A napríklad, keď vypadne, ja neviem, Napríklad na, na desiatich serveroch MySQL, tak príde proste správa, že MySQL vypadlo na desiatich serveroch alebo niečo také, hej, a je to také jednoduchšie na pochopenie, jednoduchšie z toho prevezmú tie informácie. A vie to aj e-maily, samozrejme, dá sa to proste customizovať, ak človek vlastne chce, keď vie proste programovať v Pythone. Jo. Áno, to je vlastne ďalší skript, ktorý nejak beží, ale ten ako nie je zverejnený, pretože je hodne ako špecifický na našu infraštruktúru, ale je to v podstate tiež podobná vec, ktorá sa púšťa kronom nejakých, povedzme, každých 15 minút, ktorá prebehne databázy, vygeneruje konfiguráciu, porovná si, či potrebuje nahradiť, tiež ešte to má nejaké nedostatky, samozrejme, ako každý software, ale funguje to vlastne na nejakom tomto princípe. Ja by som to kľudne vydal, ale ešte to bude treba ako troška upraviť, pretože ono fakt ako to ťaha data z tých rec tables, to by sme tam teoreticky mohli nechať, ale tie data sú v hodne špecifickom formáte, ktoré sa... Tieto veci sa nedajú našpecifikovať nejakou konfiguráciou ako exaktne, pretože by to bol konfigurák, čo by mal tisíc riadkov a to už si človek môže rovno napísať vlastný skript, takže... Ako asi by to šlo, ale bolo by, bolo by to treba osekať, pretože fakt aj, aj sa to díva do tých interných systémov, ktorých proste sú tie telefónne čísla, sú tam rôzne veci, osobné údaje a tak ďalej, takže by to chcelo tomu dať troška formu, ale ne, nebraníme sa tomu. Ako. Hm. 
No, 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 áno, v podstate, pretože... Alebo by sa na to napísal nejaký návod alebo nejaký skript, ktorý by to prostredie nejak nadefinoval, aspoň, pretože ono to tam počíta s nejakými presnými názvami nejakých presne tých riadkov v tej databázy a nejakými tými presnými vecami. A to by všetko bolo treba nejak zuniverzálniť, takže by to bolo ako hromada práce. Ako to není náš momentálne, bohužiaľ, primárny cieľ to nejak dostať von. No. Ja som sa snažil aspoň ten notifikátor, aby akš takž bol vonku, a troška som ho tiež musel osekať, ale, ale niečo aspoň len tak pre inšpiráciu, že to není ako žiadne terno, takže... Ale v budúcnosti možno bude. A... A... Áno, toto je dobrá otázka. Uh, aha, sorry. <laughs> Prečo používame NRP? Veľmi dobrá otázka. My sme vlastne zmigrovali veci, proste konfiguráciu, generáciu. Sme vymysleli tú, tú generáciu, tej konfigurácie a toto. A toto by mal byť vlastne podľa mňa nejaký druhý level, ako keby toho zlepšovania, toho monitoringu, odstránenie toho NRP a zefektívnenie vlastne celej tej štruktúry. Hej. Toto vlastne, v tomto bolo jednoduché, že tá migrácia prebehla tak, že tie čeky sa prakticky mohli zachovať v nejakej forme, takže nebolo treba robiť na strojoch nejaké veľké úpravy. Na tých strojoch proste beží furt ten klient NRPčkový, furt tam je nejak monitorovaný, konfigurovaný cez papet zase a prakticky tam nebolo nutné mať žiadnu prácu. Ale súhlasím s tým, že by bolo ako dobre použiť niečo nové a určite v budúcnosti sa tomu budeme venovať. Nerozumiem. Ako hlasnejšie. Isingu. Uh, ono to bolo tak, že ten z, zlý stav toho monitoringu nejak pretrvával a medzi tým proste prišla do, do vlastne hľadačíku tá Icinga a z hľadiska, keď sme si zhodnotili, že koľko nás to bude stať úsilia, tak nám to vyšlo vtedy najefektívnejšie ako zmigrovať na tú Icingu. Takisto všetci ľudia to poznali, poznali, ako sa to konfiguruje ten Nagios a tá Icinga je pro je podobná a akurát je efektívnejšia a je proste zlepšená. Preto sme to použili. Samozrejme používame aj iné systémy, hej, ale na tento aktívny monitoring nám to prišlo ako najlepšie. My sme používali len tú trojku a to bolo nejaké strašne ako... To, vlastne ono to bolo nejak už strašne pradávna, kedy firma mala pár serverov a vlastne to nejak nabopnalo ako klasicky. Takže... To ja netuším. Ale my sme to mali aj na koleji a tam to myslím, že platené nebolo, takže asi to nebolo platené. Ono to bola len nejaká taká tá, tá base verzia, ktorú človek nejak na konfigura. On to je ako dosť podobné, ak tá icinga, aj tá konfigurácia, tam sú tie možnosti, ale mne to prišlo osobne ako už karečie a horšie konfigurovateľné, ale samozrejme to je môj osobný názor. Áno. <laughs> No, oni sú dva. Mm. Ja by som začal s tým, že v prvom rade ja som porovnával zaťaž na Giosu, na čekovaní týchto, tohto množstva servis a rovnakého množstva servis Icingy. Icinga vyšla proste drasticky inak, ona myslím, že má lepšie handlovanie tredov a tak ďalej, proste nejak lepšie pracuje s tým výkonom. A čo sa týka toho škálovania, tak e, tamto CPUčko, ja neviem, ide na obok, ono sa to rozdieluje medzi tie dva servere, medzi tie dva master kvázy, a to CPUčko tam ide ako, ja neviem, 10%, hej. Není to ako nič, na čo by sme nejak narazili zatiaľ. Samozrejme je tam potom tá možnosť to, to distribuovať na tie leafy, alebo slavy, alebo neviem teraz presne, ako sa to volá a tie vlastne spodnejšie úrovne, ktoré len vykonávajú tie čeky a distribujú tie dáta vyššie. Tak. Pokiaľ niek- nikto už nemá dotazy, tak vám ďakujem za pozornosť. Prešli sme do slajčiny.